A very good morning to you and you're welcome to today's signpost webinar. Um, you're joining you today uh, and uh, with a slightly different agenda item than we normally would have and I'm delighted to be joined by Mary Donnelly who is the chairperson of the Irish Climate Change Advisory Council. Good morning Mary, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. Good morning and thank you for giving me the opportunity to join in a conversation with you today. No, it's an absolute honor for us to, to have you here today because we know that you are probably one of the most influential people in Ireland at the moment in terms of climate uh, change and uh, the need for us to, to transition to a, a low carbon economy. Um, and, and Pat, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Pat, you're going to help us out with questions uh, throughout the, the session. So just to let people know that we're, we're going to uh, operate today's session very much on a, a questions and answers uh, basis. And uh, so we'd encourage everybody to, to send your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of, of your screen. And uh, today's session will be recorded and will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel afterwards as well. Um, so, so Mary, before we maybe get started, perhaps you could give us a little bit of uh, your own background and um, maybe if you could talk to us as well about the, the work that you're doing uh, as chair of the Climate Change Advisory Council. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, well, I, I was appointed as chair of the council uh, in February 2021. And uh, just to give a small bit of my own background, came to it in a somewhat circuitous route. Uh, you know, uh, I started my career as a pharmacist, uh, which seems like a, a very peculiar starting point for where I ended up, and I moved on from pharmacy then um, at a point in time, I moved from Ireland to Brussels to join the European Commission. I was there with the European Commission dealing with pharmaceuticals when I started. For example, I set up the Medicines Agency, which of course is now in Amsterdam, moved from London after Brexit. And then within the commission, it, you know, you can move departments. And I moved from pharmaceuticals to employment and social affairs, dealt, for example, with gender equality as one of the areas at that stage, and then moved a third time into energy. And in the energy space, I dealt with renewable energy, energy efficiency and innovation. And I have to say, I found it a very fascinating place to be. And I think it was the area of energy expertise that uh, led to my appointment as chairman of the, the council uh, when it was revitalized in uh, the beginning of 2021 in preparation for the adoption of the legislation. Because, of course, Ireland had a milestone in climate change action in, 1920, in 2021 because the Climate uh, Action Amendment Act was adopted in July of that year. And that put Ireland very much to the fore internationally in terms of its ambition for taking climate action. It set a very high level of ambition for 2030, 51% reduction of emissions, and it set a target for net neutral uh, economy by 2050. Uh, it also put in place a number of structures because, you know, it's one thing to have a target. If you don't have the mechanisms to actually achieve that target, it tends to be lost. So the mechanisms that were put in place were firstly um, a five yearly carbon budget. And that's basically the maximum amount of emissions that we can make give give out in that five year period. So we have those for the first part of this decade, the second part as well. And also the allocation of those budgets then to the level of each of the sectors. And that's what happened in July of this year. I'm sure everybody listening was aware of that because there was quite a bit of media attention and discussion for that. And that's where, for example, agriculture has this target of a 25% emission reduction by 2030. And then again, these are targets, these are numbers. How do we get there? And that's where the Climate Action Plan comes in. And this is an annual plan that the government must produce, setting out what are the policies, what are the measures, what are the actions and also what are the funding that are going to put behind the actions in order to reduce the emissions and keep the emissions down. And that climate action plan, which is the first one really required by the legislation, is due in the next few weeks. And from the council's perspective, we're very keen to see that the, the climate action plan is shorter because we've had you know plans of six, seven hundred actions, but we really want very targeted actions, very focused actions. We need to know what are the higher impact measures and we need to know what the measure will deliver in what time scale. 
So a really focused effort on what is the action, what needs to be done. And that's what the council had called for. But perhaps maybe just to take a moment about the council. Uh, the council itself was renewed by this legislation. Uh, it was given, firstly, a slightly larger composition. So we're now 14. So we're not the 12 apostles anymore. We're 14. Um, I'm pleased to say it is fully gender balanced. We have seven and seven. Uh, it has quite a mix of uh, competences on uh, the council. So we have, of course, climate experts, you know, Professor Thorne from Maynooth, uh, Dr. Augustenberg from UCD. So we have climate experts. We've uh, Sinead O'Brien, who's a biodiversity uh, expert. We have, you know, Andrew Murphy, who's transport expert, Julie Cinnamon, who came out of uh, Enterprise Ireland, Gillian Mahan, who is a financial expert, uh, Patricia King, who is from the ICTU, so really understands the issues of what just transition are all about. Of course, John Fitzgerald is there as well. We have some international members coming from Germany and from the United States. So it allows us to have uh, a very grounded and well diverse membership. And perhaps most importantly, we have what's called three ad personum nominations. And these would be people who are on the council by virtue of the job that they do. So, for example, Laura Bork, who is the Director General of the EPA, sits on the Council. Your own, Frank O'Mara, also mm -hmm. as Director of Chagas, sits on the Council. And Owen Moran, who runs um, the meteorological, Met Aaron, also sits on the Council. And they bring their knowledge from their daily work into the discussions of the Council and enrich the discussions, of course, on that basis. So it's, it's quite a different structure now on foot of the legislation, on foot of the mandate that the council has to do, and if, quite honestly, quite a bit of work that's past and future that we have uh, before us. Wow, well, yeah, so you, it sounds like you have a really uh, high-powered team to to work with there, and uh, which, which is great. I mean, it's great to, to have a, a forum there for pulling together that expertise. Um, we're two years into our carbon budget now. Uh, where are we now, or and how is it going? Well, where are we now? Uh, so our baseline is 2018. That's when the that's the year we took as the baseline for the carbon budgets. And when we made the recommendation on the budgets, the first five years, we said, OK, we need a 4.8 percent reduction per annum equivalent in the first five years. But then that goes to an 8.3 percent for the second five years. And the reason we did that was because we knew that it was going to take time to set up structures, to put investment in place to put the procedures in place and to get the whole system going. So our, our carbon budget in the first two years was effectively foreseen to remain more or less static. And I have to say that is the case. At best, we are static, some maybe not even static, uh, but it now means we have to have a dramatic reduction. We really have to put in place all of the measures, the actions to achieve the objective. Um, where are we now? Maybe it's useful just to give a small overview of, of, of the various sectors. Um, of course, I'm working now on estimated figures because the figures take a little time to, to be finalized. But if I take the sectors, the, the, the sector that has the highest target for emission reduction is electricity. We're looking at an 80% reduction of emissions from the electricity sector by 2030, which is huge, of course. The reason for this is because we have the natural resources in Ireland. We have wind, we have solar, the technology is known. We need to roll it out, we need to put it in place and we need to get the benefit from it. However, having said that, we are confronted with an external crisis coming from the Ukraine war, which has had a huge impact on the price of energy and potentially even the availability of energy. So this is a challenge. So in the face of an external uh, crisis, shall we say, we still have to try and keep on track in the electricity system to keep the, em the emissions down. The next big area is transport. And transport has gone through, shall we say, the COVID years where emissions were reduced. But we're now experiencing a rebound effect. And the emissions in transport, in fact, are going up. Uh, what we used to do when COVID was there in terms of using our own cars and whatever, it's all forgotten. We're now back to traffic jams and congestion. So the, the message really out of this is that 
Uh, you cannot rely on a spontaneous incident to reduce emissions. It needs to be structural. We need to have a plan and a structure in place in order to maintain the emission reductions. A third big area is, of course, buildings and heating, particularly in buildings. And here we're about level because uh, we're, we're doing a lot in the area of retrofit of houses, uh, installation of heat pumps, decarbonisation of the heat system. But on the other hand, we have a population that's growing and we have a huge housing demand. So we are increasing the construction of houses. So it's, it's almost as if one is pulling against the other in terms of emission reductions. And then, of course, I come to agriculture. Uh, and in the agricultural space, the target is a 25% reduction by 2030. Uh, we'll be talking about the details of that as we go forward. Key issues here is that, as I've said from the earlier um, sectors, you know, we will have external factors that will impact on the trajectory and on the path. So we need to be able to be resilient for those. We also need that when we do get an opportunity to reduce emissions, it becomes structural and that we don't rebound back in again. But I think perhaps the most important message really comes out of what, what I was talking about for buildings is, you know, it's all about people. This is a this is a journey that we're all on. It's a transition we're all on. And it involves people. It's about people. It's about people's lives. It's about people's incomes. We have to have a mechanism where we can explain to people what's going on, bring people with us. They have a voice. They have a view. We need to listen to that view. We need to support the measures that are necessary, help people to take those measures so that collectively we can actually deliver a better and a more sustainable society across all of the sectors and across all of our society. Um, you attended the the launch of the climate action uh, strategy yesterday in in Dublin, and you talked about the urgency in tackling climate change and the need to accelerate our responses to the the crisis. And uh, you know, we we do see a frustration uh, amongst younger people, in particular, about the lack of action being taken by governments and by uh, corporates. I mean, do you think that society? is taking the uh, this, this situation or the issue seriously enough? Well, <clears throat> anyway, uh, on a survey of my own conversations with people, I think it's absolutely clear that people in Ireland, one, understand that we are in a climate crisis, mm -hmm. two, want to take action. And the challenge really is to make available to people the options that will allow them to take action. Uh, if I move out of agriculture for the moment and talk, say, about transport, you know, we have congestion, we have traffic jams, and it's very expensive with the increased prices of both petrol and diesel. What is absolutely essential is we have to provide an option, an alternative to people. You yeah. know, it's great if you can walk, fine, it's good for your health. Mm -hmm. If you can cycle, good as well. If you can take public transport, that's an option as well. But we have to ensure that there is enough public transport there in the right places at the right times and at an affordable price in order that it provides an option to people as an alternative to the car. And that's why, for example, as part of the recommendations we made to government coming into the financial budget, we said, OK, you did an experiment on reducing public uh, transport fares. You've got to keep that. And indeed, they did because we have to make it financially attractive for people, as well as making the facilities available where you have a choice and you can make that choice and that will make a difference in the end of the day. Mm. So I think it's there, but I think it is slow. It mm. takes a long time to roll these things out. Quick fixes are very difficult to find and put in place. So, you know, sometimes, uh, and I'll be very blunt on this, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. You know, we want more housing and then we have objections to housing development. We want more onshore wind because it's renewable and it's decarbonized and it's cheaper. But we have objections to wind farms. So I think we have to understand and appreciate that. Yes, consultation is absolutely essential. We have to listen to people's voices. But there are times when we need to move more quickly mm -hmm. in terms of the actions that we take. Well, I agree with you and those fundamental principles of that need for structural change and the incentives or the 
the, the signposts for people to, to to move that direction. Absolutely. And I, I do think we do need to move faster on those uh, introducing that structural change, be it transport or energy or, or, or agriculture, of course. Um, a question just came in from our audience, with, and I think it's just appropriate to this part of the discussion. It's about the, the responsibility for the monitoring and the enforcement of the actions set out of the Climate uh, Action Plan. Who, whose responsibility is that? And, and what are the consequences if, if those actions aren't actually implemented? Okay, so the Act foresees that uh, the minister, the respective ministers are responsible for the sector targets. So it's the Minister for Agriculture, for example, who is responsible for achieving and maintaining the carbon budget in the agricultural sector. And the mechanism that's operated is that, uh, you know, we have Chagas and SEAI collect basic data. It's combined together by the EPA, and then we get what's called the inventory. And we review the inventory and we make comments on it. Are we on track or are we not? Now, the timeline for that would normally be inventory would come maybe May, June, we will come out with our review in July. And then the Oireachtas, the joint uh, Oireachtas committee will then, shall we say, interview or discuss with each of the ministers their performance for their sector on the basis of that review. So it's, you know, uh, I've been a civil servant for many years. Uh, when you send your minister into the Oireachtas and he has a difficult meeting or she has a difficult meeting as the case may be, uh, you get away with it once, you don't get away with it a second time. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's um, a process where it is the minister who is responsible for the sector policies and actions and funding, but also delivery of the climate uh, agenda that has to report to the Oireachtas each year on the delivery of it. And, you know, people have said, is there a fine? Well, it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense to say this is a fine. We don't fine ourselves internally. Brussels will, of course, in due course, come with fines if Ireland Inc. doesn't achieve uh, the, the targets that are being set as part of the Fit for 55 package. Mm -hmm. But the more important process is the process that we have internally uh, within the structure here in Ireland. At, at the launch of uh, the, the Chagas strategy yesterday, uh, we, Chagas set out the, the really ambitious uh, actions over the next number of years, a new signpost advisory program for all farmers, digital sustainability platform, and uh, a virtual research and innovation program. What, what was your own reaction to the, the, pro, the program that was presented yesterday? Well, firstly, I was very pleased to, to be there and to have the opportunity to understand what's in the strategy. I think it's an excellent strategy. Uh, it's, it's impressive because it's based on science. It's based on known technologies, certainly in the early stages, the rollout of those. And it's accompanied by a mechanism where the communication and the support and the available expertise will be made available to farmers to allow them and to support them in making the change. So for me, it is a very well thought out strategy, mm -hmm. pragmatic, practical, and as a consequence, entirely achievable. I won't go so far as to say that on the basis of it, it's so good that maybe the target could be increased from 25% to something higher. But I think it certainly uh, reinforces the message that agriculture is in the space and is up for the challenge of delivering the emission reduction. Yes, and, and that certainly was the, the tone from the farm organizations yesterday that farmers are up for the challenge. But of course, um, you know, the, 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 there is support needed there to, uh, to help farmers move to that carbon neutral uh, farming system. And of course, farmers are are being challenged from from all directions at the moment. We have water quality, we have biodiversity, we have soil quality, we have climate change, uh, and then they have to try and make a living uh, at the end of it. Um, uh, do, you, do you think that there are you know sufficient supports there for farmers um, to to allow for that that transition to? To reduce uh, the environmental impact of, of farming because they are at the bottom of the supply chain regardless of what way we look at it they are price takers and um we we often look at that that position as being sometimes a, a weaker position in the, the food supply chain and that the costs are end up being passed on to farmers 
just be interested in your views there because we are in a, uh, I suppose, a, a sector in Ireland where we want to try and attract young people into the sector, but with sometimes being viewed as a lot of challenges being faced, um, we wonder how how attractive is it to for for younger people. And we do see the numbers of farmers across Europe reducing the the average age of of farmers is increasing. Um, so I'm just interested in your thoughts and and how we can we can turn that one around. Okay, well, I think, firstly, can I just put, put it into context where Ireland sits vis-a-vis -vis other countries, both in Europe and elsewhere in the world? So uh, when, when I look at it from a climate perspective and, and an emissions perspective, um, agricultural emissions, if you take agriculture and certainly land use emissions in Ireland, would be the second highest relative share of any country in the world, aside from New Zealand. So we're at 35%, 30-35% emissions in the agricultural space, and you can add on more for the, the land use space, which makes us, you know, really an outlier versus the European Union. Our closest would be the, the Netherlands at less than 20%. So we are quite unique. Mm -hmm. But we're also quite unique in the farming practices that we have in Ireland. Uh, it is arguably the most sustainable farming mechanism that we have and it is already entrenched and established in the country. So we are in a leader, leadership position there. So I think the opportunity really does exist for Ireland to take and run with this. You know, we are different, but we are better. But let's show the world that we are better and demonstrate how sustainability really works in a farming sense. Now, the question I think you have to look at, you know, are we talking about the annihilation of farming? Clearly not. You know, we, we will need food. We will need food in, food in 2030. We'll need food in 2050 and indeed beyond. And we will continue to consume, for example, animal proteins over that period of time. So our challenge is to ensure that we are able to produce, you know, the top quality, best food in a sustainable way and to continue to present Ireland on the international stage as the most sustainable option. And the reason why I put some emphasis on the international stage is, of course, because we export so much of our food mm -hmm. and we have a very good reputation. It's absolutely essential that we maintain that reputation, that we don't allow others to do damage to it. And, you know, people, if the people can point to the fact that we're not reducing our emissions in the country or in agriculture, that's a weak point. So we really can't afford to have a weak point like that in our international markets. But the second message is that we are producing the best and therefore we should position ourselves as the best and the premium and look for the prices and get the prices that we need for that. So certainly from an international perspective where we export so much of our product, the direction of challenge, uh, travel is absolutely clear. We need sustainability. We need to demonstrate sustainability and we need to get the reward for that in our markets. Closer to home, I think we can do more, to be perfectly honest. Um, for example, and just as an illustration, uh, and this could be a voluntary agreement maybe, but you know, in Denmark, supermarkets have to carry a minimum share of organic products in the supermarkets. You know, maybe we should be looking at things like, should we have a minimum share of organics? Should we have a minimum share of local, locally produced products on the shelves in our supermarkets? Doesn't have to be by legislation, but it could be a voluntary proposal by the supermarkets to do that because in the end of the day that's the funnel where the consumer meets what the farmer produces so i think you know we do need to think about that we do need to think about how farmers are rewarded in the marketplace for the products that they produce and how the consumers can best do that and then of course there is a third area that we need to look at i mean it's a business some of these costs these changes are going to be costly and it is correct that the government supports the business of farming in the transition to greater sustainability. It will happen in the transport area. You know, there are grants there, for example, for electric vehicles. There are grants for retrofit of houses. Yes, we also need to support the business of farming in the transition to a greater sustainability. CAP will do it, but also our own national budget has to be used to do it. So uh, there are various levels that one needs to look at in this. And out of it all, I would say, yes, is there a future without any doubt? I mean, you know, you 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 go into your, your job at 20 or 18 or 20 or 21 years of age, 
you say to yourself, is this business going to be around forever? Nobody knows, but I can be sure farming and the production of food is still going to be there 50 years from now. Uh, you talked about just transition, and we know that there have been endless papers, policy papers written about the, the need for a just transition to a, a carbon neutral society. But uh, we know that if the proper structures that you refer to, are, if they're not put in place, that there, there is a real risk that the more vulnerable parts of the economy and society will suffer. Uh, what structures do we need to put in place in agriculture to ensure that we do have a that tr just transition uh, in Ireland? Well, I, I think it, the, mo the most equitable and just action that policymakers, government and others, including the council ourselves, can take is to be honest with people. I, you know, there is we are on a journey. And I think it's very important that we set out the journey for people so that they can see the direction of travel. I mean, if I move out of agriculture and, and, and talk about, for example, peat fired power stations in, in, in the Midlands, you know, we have to be honest with people that the journey of travel there was closure. It happened perhaps a little bit faster than people expected, but the journey was, was clear. But had we put play, measures in place to support people who were going to be impacted? No, we hadn't. We should have been, you know, 10 years in advance saying this is going to happen. Can you retrain? Would you like to set up your own business? What are the alternatives? Have the options for people there so that they can be prepared. It's the same in agriculture. There will be changes in agriculture. We need to explain what the likely changes are and we need to support farmers in the choices that they make. In some instances, it means that income can only be preserved by adding on additional and diversified activities. What are those? How do you get into them? And how can you benefit from them? This is what we have to make available. It might be alternative forms of farming. It might be production of energy. It might be, you know, anaerobic digestion as the case may be. What are the alternative sources of income to ensure that in the end of the day, the revenue is sufficient for farmers to live, you know, the life that they deserve to live, whilst safeguarding the environment for the rest of us. Because in the end of the day, you know, it's all our environments, all of those beautiful fields that I see on the screen behind you, that's all of our environment. And it's in our interest that we maintain that to the best condition and position into the future. So yes, we need all of the measures to support farmers and we cannot leave people behind. Uh, you you have a, a very strong background in renewable energy uh, in your role in the European Commission. Uh, what role can Irish farmers play in uh, producing renewable energy in Ireland? Well, firstly, uh, Ireland is very fortunate uh, in that we have huge natural resources. You know, the, the Industrial Revolution passed Ireland by because we didn't have any coal. So coal and steel and all that heavy industry didn't happen in, in the Irish context. With the sustainable revolution, which is where we are now, the resource comes from wind and solar and longer term, it will come from uh, the, the ocean as well. But right now we have wind, we have solar and we know how we have the technologies. We know what they cost. They're actually cheaper than fossil fuels to, to put in place. We have the opportunity to become self-sufficient from our wind and solar. It sounds crazy when you consider that we spend somewhere about 8 billion euros a year importing fossil fuels. We can actually substitute that with our own energy coming from our own natural resources. What does it mean? It means we do need to have lots more solar. I mean, frankly, my view is that every single roof, house, shop, pub, school, barn, milking parlor, everything covered in solar because it's a, a quite a cheap technology. It's very easy to manage. You really, it's like a light bulb. You don't have to do anything with it. It produces energy during the day. It's cost effective and it can make a difference. We how, need- Mary, how can we accelerate that that's, uh, that that transition to, to solar, that rollout of solar see, still seems to be relatively slow uh, across Ireland? Uh, I wonder, do we, do we need to be uh, putting more structural supports in place there. I mean, from financial institutions, for example, to to support that uh, that that movement that's needed. 
I, I think so. And in fact, what you say is very, very important. I think a uh, more structured approach is actually what's necessary. I would go further and say that collective purchase and rollout of solar is a serious opportunity. And, you know, we have in agriculture a number of groupings, farm organizations and others. Uh, the, the opportunity to have bulk purchase, which, of course, brings with it a reduced cost, mm -hmm. along with the technical support to roll it out, is a real opportunity at the current uh, time. And that, for me, would be one of the things that I would really strongly encourage and support happening. Uh, we need it, you know, we need it also, for example, sports organizations like the GAA. This is what we need to do. We need to mobilize the collective in our society to get the benefit across all of the individual opportunities that exist. Wind, onshore wind also. I know sometimes people object to a wind farm going up no nearby, but that's the wind farm that's keeping your lights on. That's the wind farm that's driving your milk machine. So I think, you know, we have to understand the connection between the infrastructure, including the grid, and the fact that we can have our lights on and we can run our heating, we can run our milking machines. So I'm very positively disposed to that because we're very, very lucky. Longer term, we will have offshore wind. But in this decade, it's the onshore wind, it's the solar. That's the opportunity and we need to maximize it. Farmers are hugely important in this sense. I mean, when solars were initially rolled out in Europe, I'm talking now 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, it was the farmers in Germany who adopted solar panels. And at a point in time, they were producing 50% of the renewable electricity in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's how big a role farmers played in Germany in the rollout of solar. So I think we have that opportunity here in Ireland as well. I saw a very interesting post by a farmer on social media. Um, it was around the time of harvest this year, and he was in his combine uh, uh, harvesting a field of wheat. And uh, he was commenting on the fact that this very productive field of wheat was soon going to be uh, covered in solar panels because of the uh, I suppose the policy and incentives that are there in place to support that. Um, I suppose he, he was frustrated with this because he felt we're, we're you know, earlier in the year, the, the, the narrative was very much about food security. And and then now he's seeing these this these these areas. Now, maybe he was a, con a contractor, but, uh, you know, is do we need a better joined up thinking between our our, our food security policies and our energy security policies. And, you know, how do you see that working out or do we need uh, a better policy around land use? Yes. In fact, you've put your finger on it there. We need not just a better policy. We need a policy on land use, in fact, in this country. It is one of the issues that the government have, has identified. Uh, it's taking a while to develop it. It's not easy. I'm the first to acknowledge, you know, it's it's a a complex question and there are many issues to take into account in that but I think you're absolutely right we do need a land use strategy in this country uh, you know land is our resource and who would have a resource and not plan how you're going to use it so I think you're right I, I, I can't say yay or nay to using solar panels on you know good land at the moment we have commercial activity going on in that space I can say definitively rolling out solar on rooftops it's a no-brainer mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's one that really we have to go for but the so the land use is is particularly important and to some extent it also brings in the question of how do we balance the sources of emissions which we have and will have into the future because we will still have animals with the sink opportunities of our grasslands but also our forestry so you know, where's the balance there? How can we look at the numbers? How can we manage that process so that we have, you know, a correctly balanced utilization of this hugely valuable resource, which is our land? Before we get on to the audience questions, there's one area that an important area that we haven't discussed so far is, um, you know, there's the huge emphasis on our reduction in our emissions uh, from from the various different sectors. But we also have this um, category of called Lulu CF or land use and land use change of forestry that 
there are targets that Ireland need to hit in terms of reducing its emissions from from our land. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that, because I think it's it's something that uh, people in general aren't probably aware enough of. OK, so uh, Lulu CF is, is, as you say, that it's the land side of the business. So there's a number of issues there. Um, and again, Ireland is distinct from many of the other European countries. And it's, it's a position that we have to make sure Brussels understands, because right now there are targets being set for each of the member states for the reduction of emissions in the Lulu CF space. And we will have a target just like everybody else. Uh, we have emissions coming from our peatlands and our bogs, which is a real challenge for us to try and address that. Uh, we have a reduced capacity to absorb emissions because of our forestry situation. As you know, we have a national target of about 8,000 hectares a year. We haven't reached that any time in the last number of years. We're down at about 2,000. Uh, our forest is aging and therefore our forests sink over time will diminish. So the capacity to absorb the emissions in our forest is something that's weakening. And just you know, to put it into context, we have about um, eight to 11% forestry in Ireland. The target is to get to 18 to 20% by 2030. In Europe, on average, it's 34% forestry. So you know, we're in a very different situation here in Ireland to the other countries in Europe. Um, but it's absolutely essential in order to maintain farming practices, that we develop this sink. So the recent announcement for forestry and the better supports coming through that, that's really important. But we now have to turn that into a reality and make it happen on the ground. And the targets that are being set means we have to also plan how we're going to reduce our emissions in the peatlands, um, what we're going to do with our mineral soils, so there's a whole program there that we will have to implement over the next number of years to try and rebalance it. And just in terms of the future, from 2030, Europe will start to look at not Lulu CF, which is land use and forestry, but AFALU, which is a combination of agricultural land use and forestry. So it'll be put together as one entity from 2030. And that's also something that we have to think about in terms of, you know, what emissions we do now in the agricultural space, but how do we develop our land use, the, the Lulu, Lulu CF side between now and 2030, so that when we hit the ground running in 2031, that we're in a good place and we can take it forward. Just while we're talking about that, and we will uh, go to, to audience more audience questions now, but we do have a question here. What, what place does carbon farming uh, uh, look like in the context of the Climate Act? And will trading of credits out of farming or Lulu CF put pressure on our ability to produce food? So very insightful que question there around uh, that, that idea around carbon farming. And, and trading of carbon credits ultimately yes um i mean so the idea of carbon farming it's 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 currently in development uh, not just in ireland but more generally there's some discussions as to what it means and how it would operate and whatever uh, and and the thing about carbon farming is you could have for example a pan-european carbon farming market or it, we could decide in ireland just to have a carbon farming market just for ourselves so we don't have to follow the European system, we could have just our own for our own national uh, targets. Um, the idea of carbon farming means that the first, as you know, in, in the first rule or the first basis of there is you have to know your starting point. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole process whereby you need to benchmark the starting point because it's only by benchmarking the starting point that you can envisage the progress. And I think we will be confronted with the questions of do we use benefits from carbon farming in farm, in, in farm A, preferentially in the agricultural sector, or do we use it in the non-agricultural sector? And I, I'll be very honest, I think that's a, a real policy question to think about. I think we have to think about what's the most equitable way of doing it. Uh, this is a personal view, of course, but I don't think it would be right to sell carbon saving from farms in Ireland that could be used, let's say, internationally by some large conglomerate. 
You know, yeah. I would be much more in favor of we get the benefit, we use the benefit for the benefit of everybody. But this will be a discussion, I think, that we will have going forward. Well, yeah, there's definitely some deeper ethical questions around the whole offsetting and, you know, whether whether that's something that we should be engaged in at all. Um, Pat, you've been waiting patiently there. There's lots and lots of questions coming in from, from our audience this morning. So uh, maybe, Pat, if you could take us through some of those. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. Uh, I think the one that is, is re reflected in a number of questions, and I'll just go with, with, with one of the questions, regulatory change in Ireland is happening extremely quickly, and it's coming from a, a variety of, of sources now, national and, and, and EU. Uh, and the example is given of, of nitrates banding and, and, the staff, uh, and potential for, for uh, a cap in relation to derogation. The, the question, though, is, is uh, the this, I suppose, disparate a sourcing of 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 regulation and and short termism is this fair for for farmers or do we need a comprehensive policy uh, framework that's going to stick with farmers for for the a number of years and allow them to make uh, uh, good decisions uh, uh, particularly where investments are involved. So uh, the the reality of the situation, you're quite right. We have rules and regulations coming from Brussels and we have rules and regulations coming from Dublin and elsewhere. So uh, it is true that there is a plethora. Right now at the moment, I think it is overwhelming because we have what we call at a European level, this fit for 55 package. And there are 18 pieces of legislation in that, not to mention the other bits that are coming alongside it. So it is a huge amount of adjustment, modernization, change of the legislation that currently applies in Europe. And it's it's all happening at the same time. Uh, I would go so far as to say it's almost confusing to try and keep track of it. And then, so then we are, at the, like any member state, we're trying to follow that and ultimately implement it. And at the same time, we have measures that we need to bring in in Ireland. So yes, you're right that the policy environment is changing. I mean, I you, we have to acknowledge that if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, the policy environment would be would have been totally, totally different. The message then, as we came out, for example, of milk quotas, the direction of travel for policy, for farming, was a very different direction to where we are today. And the coherence of the policy direction today is perhaps a difficulty in terms of how we're communicating it. You know, has it been joined up as the message? Have we made clear what the direction of travel is and what it means for people. It goes back to what I was saying earlier on. We are on a journey. We need to put up the signposts of the direction so that people can understand what's the direction of travel of that journey and make their choices and in response to it. There's a, a, a comment coming in about the availability of the of the tools to reduce our emissions from solar panel and batteries being available to protect a urea being available to EVs being available. Uh, are we doing enough to, to make sure the supply chain of the technologies uh, is enabling people to, to respond? Well, the supply the supply chains across all of those are under stress right now. I mean, this has come out of COVID uh, where production did falter in some areas it's been exacerbated by the Chinese COVID restrictions and I have to say the war in Ukraine and what it has done for energy prices I mean we've all seen what has happened to the cost of energy uh, I was just looking this morning that you know 18 months ago a megawatt of gas natural gas was five euros a megawatt today it's 240 I mean, that is an unimaginable increase in price. I don't think anybody could ever have foreseen something like that. And that's having a knock on consequence on anything that is produced using energy. So you can see it in fertilizer prices, for example. You can see it in the cost of diesel or petrol into our cars. You can see it at the cost of heating oil. You can see it in the cost of electricity. And that's having an impact uh, on the supply chains. So what's the challenge for us? Uh, what I was saying earlier on, in certain areas of technology, bulk purchase is a real option that we need to think about because we need to be in there in the space. When I look at some of the other areas that we're developing, if I take offshore wind, there Ireland has had to put its cards on the table and say, this is what we're looking for, because if you don't do that, you won't get the supply chain. 
for the necessary technologies. So you're right, the supply chains right now are under stress, prices are increasing, we have inflation. What we need to do is to tackle some of the root causes, particularly in terms of the price of energy, and support people to find ways to reduce costs. So reducing, obviously, fertilizer using, moving into protected urea, but also on the energy side is an area that we need to look at in terms of supporting people in this in this uh, very challenging time. There's, I suppose, an almost inevitable question in relation to the size of the national herd uh, and what role it has to play and, and where policy might go in relation to that. So, uh, I, I, as, I, as I have been told on numerous occasions, there is no such thing as the national herd. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think I will reply on that basis. Uh, <laughs> each farmer has their own herd, has their own animals, and each farmer will have, have to take on board the changes that are happening in, and respond to those in order to be sustainable. It might mean in some instances that the number of animals that a farmer will carry will change in order to ensure their income security. It might mean that, you know, if you have lower fertilizer because of the costs and all of that, what you can carry might be impacted. And farmers, you know, they're businessmen, they know their business, they know how to react to that. There are policies in place to reduce emissions. I mean, I'm not going to recite them all now. And they may certainly have an impact on the overall number of animals in the country. But there is no policy to go out there, you know, with a size, cut down the number of animals, you know, willy nilly. This is something that will evolve as we move into the sustainable area. And farmers will respond and react appropriately on their own farms. That's a really important message, I think. You know, in the end of the day, this is a decision that the farmer will make respect to, in respect of their own farm. This is not a decision that's going to come out of Dublin. Mm. Mary, it's just in that, that that context of, you know, alternative land uses and and you know, uh, adjusting to this lower carbon uh, sector that we, we have to, to be in this place by 2030 and ultimately 2050. Um, you know, do you think there's enough work being done in that space to look at alternative sources of income or uh, diversification options for uh, farmers or for land use in general? Well, I, I, I can ask you that question, in fact, because I think really that's where Chagas comes to the fore. Yes, we do need to explore all of the alternative options that are out there. And I think we have to be a little bit open minded as well. You know, sometimes we've kind of said, no, 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 it's it's not viable. It's not you know, productive. It's not going to deliver an income. I think we have to be very open mm -hmm. to all of the permutations, accommodations that exist out there. And um, I think we do need the research to support the alternative, you know, if you're going down the route of organic, if you're going down the route of producing hemp, for example, if you're going down the route of producing, you know, energy on your farm, what's the best way of doing it? How can you integrate it into your current system? And what does it mean for your historic practice of farming on your farm? And that's the kind of research that we're looking to jog us for. We need you to come out with the numbers and the best ways and how you can blend I suppose part of the message here is that we're probably looking at more blending of income sources going forward than historically, you know, a focus on a single end, single way and a single mechanism. So I think, yes, that we do need more research on that. We need to be able to disseminate that research to farmers. Yes, uh, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here. Does Ireland have the data and the technology to ac accurately determine and map emissions uh, uh, and sequestration uh, and uh, um, uh, the potential of, of Lulu CF? So, I, I mean, first of all, you, you, this is a very important question because everything we do in this space has to be based on science and the best science. Having said that, science is constantly evolving. So we will have to evolve as science evolves. And also in the Irish context, we, have, we are using some default scientific uh, numbers because we have not actually done the analysis in the Irish context 
to apply those numbers in Ireland. So there will be instances where, for example, emissions from peat, we're using default figures because we haven't yet got the results of studies where we can specifically say in an Irish context, this is what the number actually is. Those studies are going on. We will have the results in the next two, three years. And as necessary, we will adjust to the science. So if the science says it's higher, it's lower, as the case may be, we will respond to that and we will take the new scientific information on board and we'll build that into our numbers. And, you know, hopefully the results might be more favorable for us, but we don't know. Sometimes it can be more negative, but we'll just take the science as it comes. We have to do that. Look, I suppose a number of questions in there about the credit being given to agriculture, particularly, I suppose, for uh, energy uh, production that might come from the agricultural sphere and about the fairness and the signals in, in relation to that. Well, firstly, I, I really do believe that um, energy production uh, from our land, as I said, you know, from our rooftops and whatever, uh, is a hugely important part. And it, it's absolutely essential in the in the current environment where security of supply for energy in Ireland is in jeopardy, just like it is everywhere else in Europe. So we have to rely on our own resources. Uh, there are mechanisms in place, uh, both from Department of Agriculture under the TAMS going forward the acres, uh, also from the SEAI to support that. It, it's one of the issues, uh, I've kind of asked the question more generally of Chagas, but also in the council, uh, could we not put these packages together in a in an understandable way uh, for farmers to see what are the grants, what are the combination of grant supports that are out there? I mean, in an ideal world, if you have uh, solar panels, for example, on your milking parlor, on your other uh, outbuildings, as the case may be, you're generating power. You might have sufficient capacity there that you're actually putting some into a battery. You can run at least 30% of your business from that. And when you're not doing it, sell it back to the grid. And I know that's a point of sensitivity. I believe it should be sold back to the grid. Why not? Um, but not just on the farm, but think of the farm home, you know, running the heating system, if you have a heat pump in the home. Uh, many farmers will have a second car. Could the second car be an electric car? And you're charging it from your own generated power on site. So the idea of being a mini, uh, you know, autonomous entity is, is a real possibility in the structures that we have in Ireland. And that's one that, you know, if you bring together all of the supports that we have, I think it becomes financially very viable for many farms in Ireland. And that's certainly something that I'd like to see happen. Okay, I, I suppose you, you've talked a lot about uh, wind and solar, but th there's, I suppose, some question marks around, I suppose, our ability to move comprehensively to wind and solar in terms of the need for increased and, and better connectivity within our national grid, connectivity to a European uh, uh, um, energy market, and I suppose the development of batteries and hydrogen technologies. Where do you see th those, I suppose, technologies uh, uh, developing or, or can they develop fast enough to allow us to move to that uh, uh, solar and wind uh, uh, pr production uh, uh, level that you talk about? Okay, solar and wind, I, I talk about those because <clears throat> we have the resource, we have the technologies, and they're good value for money. They're, they're fairly cheap in the scale of things. Um, what do we need to make them happen? Obviously, we need to roll both of them out in terms of generation, but we also need to reinforce our grid. And that means, you know, I have to say it up front, and that means we will have pylons that we have to roll out. We will have to reinforce the grid in order to do that. And we will have to support it with batteries. But one area that we can do right now is what we call demand management. You know, we are rolling out smart meters. There are times when we have a plentiful supply of energy coming from wind. We need to use that energy when it's available. Much of that might be at nighttime when we're not, you know, commercially using the, the power. So demand management is a really important opportunity that's actually free. You know, it's a behavioral thing that can be done. Going forward, yes, we will have the opportunity to produce hydrogen in Ireland. Uh, we will have interconnectors. The Celtic interconnector, for example, is now starting to be rolled out to France. We have interconnectors, the Greenway link to the UK, a further one. Yes, we need those 
and we'll probably need more going forward. Uh, we will have hydrogen coming on stream. It's going to be a very important resource for the country. We will be able to do many things with it. But right now, focus is today. What's the technology today? What can we do today? Let's run with the technologies we know. Uh, we know how to do them and they're cost effective. Is there, uh, uh, I suppose, a, a question here in relation to, I suppose, the political piece in relation to the food vision dairy and the food vision, uh, I suppose, the dairy one is 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 uh, uh, further along, but and also the food vision uh, beef and sheep reports, where the farmers uh, farmers organisations are, are are not on board. Is there a, a mechanism in you uh, in your view to bring farmers on board there to to resolve the issues that are there? Uh, and how necessary is this for moving forward? Well, <clears throat> how necessary is it? I would say it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, you know, I have been confronted frequently with this supposed uh, urban rural divide on climate. Personally, I don't believe it. I haven't yet met a farmer who hasn't been deeply involved with sustainability as a concept and as a practice. Most farmers that I meet feel that they are guardians of the land for the next generation. So, you know, sustainability is ingrained in farmers in Ireland. So it's not correct to say that we have this urban rural divide. But if farm leaders constantly say no to plans, whatever the plan might be, that's the message that's coming out in the media. So what I would urge is that whatever it is that the farm leaders want, make it clear, set out their own plan. Let's look at that and let's see if we can work with it to deliver the results. But just saying no all of the time is giving the wrong message. It's, it, it's not doing a service to farmers. It's not doing a service to the real sentiment, I believe, exists within agriculture in Ireland. We need to have a yes mentality and then set out what is, this is the criteria. It's yes, because we want this, this and this, rather than no, because we don't like it, that, that and that. There's a, a question there in relation to our, our ambition and, and I suppose asking the question, are we moving too fast and putting ourselves at a, a disadvantage in terms of our, our ambition vis-a-vis -vis most of the rest of the world and, and particularly in, ag in an agricultural context? We are... We have the second highest level of ambition in the world with our target, but our target reflects what the science says. You know, the science says 1.5 degrees. We're currently at 1.1 degrees. So really, we shouldn't be leaders. Everybody else should be at the same space as ourselves. But, you know, it's not just that we want to be a leader for the sake of it. We need to be a leader. We export our product. We export it to a world market. We export it on the basis that we are green and we are sustainable. We have to demonstrate and support that. So, you know, it's in self-interest. It's not just for climate action. This is an important position that Ireland Inc. needs to take for its international markets. So I think, you know, we can kill many uh, birds with this one stone of achieving our objectives for our climate action. Not just globally for global temperatures. We can do it for ourselves and we can do it for our biggest export in the food sector which is absolutely essential okay we're we're hard to believe we're we're, we're uh, at half past 10 mary uh, i don't know where that hour went um thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning um it has been really important i think as part of the the overall communications around climate change because uh, so many of our audience are really important influencers within the agri-food sector and uh, it's important to get it from from source uh, as to what's happening. Uh, I, I I have lots more questions that I I wanted to cover, uh, but just time time was against us on this occasion. But maybe if you were open to maybe joining us again at, at some time in the future and maybe giving us an update on on the the good work that you're doing uh, as part of the the climate change advisory council, we we would very much appreciate that. And um and and thank you also for your your contributions yesterday today at the, the launch of the, the Chagas Climate Action Strategy. And uh, I want to wish you well in the work that you're doing. In, in the, it's not a, an easy task, uh, given that there are so many different, um, I suppose, sensitivities uh, across uh, society around climate. But there's, there's no question that 
the, the the two words I think that you used yesterday were we need to accelerate our our, our actions and uh, we need to inject a whole lot of urgency into into this whole area. And I think look uh, from my dealings with the agri food sector, it, it, it certainly farmers and the entire sector are up for the challenge and I think are making those moves. Uh, albeit uh, we need to to get get them embedded in the as as we say the time for talking is now over and uh, action action is is what's is, is what is required um so thank you again mary and uh we hopefully will have you again uh, on the on the on the webinar in 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 the not too distant future pat thanks so much for for helping uh with the questions this morning and uh also to yvonne maher for helping out in the background with the uh the questions this morning as well or with with the uh, technology in the background so uh next week uh we will be joined on the signpost webinar um by uh, uh, Ewan Mullins. Uh, Ewan Mullins, head of the crop science department at Chagask, and he'll be talking to us about a step by step uh, developing integrated pest management strategies to reduce chemical inputs, because we know that uh, that is another challenge facing the farming sector is reducing its reliance on pesticides. So some really good work going on in Chagask uh, and across Europe around reducing and uh, developing strategies to, to reduce that reliance. Mary, thanks once again. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Nice talking to you today. Okay. Good morning. Thank thanks, everybody.